uh, the uh, uh, the major issue with the Marco Polo Bridge incident. And at that point, China decided that, or the nationalists in China decided that this was the end of the uh, the century of humiliation, and they were going to fight back against the Japanese. Well, they have to come up with an idea of where this is actually going to take place. How are they going to fight back against the Japanese? And simply, is they're going to look at the city of Shanghai. And Shanghai has had numerous incidents. And when I talk about the, the this time between 1932 and 1937, so from the Manchurian invasion by the Japanese until the Marco Polo Bridge, it's not like everything was peaceful. There were continuous incidents going on at this time frame. So there were major incidents, of course, in Shanghai. Well, right at this time, there's another major incident. There is a Japanese uh, army officer that is found uh, wandering around spying, perhaps, at a Chinese airbase. Uh, he resists uh, capture and is killed by the Chinese. The Japanese are very, very, very angry about this and demand that the Chinese withdraw all their troops from Shanghai. Well, needless to say, they're not going to do that. So th this is becomes an issue of where are we going to resist the Japanese and where they are going to resist, as I said, is in Shanghai. And there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, first of all, remember the, the big attacks were all up in the north and that's by the Beijing area. And the Chinese are very, very afraid that once the Ch Japanese have captured Beijing, that they're going to continue to move further west and north and cut off their supply line from the Soviet Union. That would be a bad thing. So that gives them a reason why they want to fight in Shanghai. Another big reason is, of course, that if you look at the map, you can see that Shanghai and Nanjing are about 170 miles apart. This is key because this is Chang's base of power. His capital is that city of Nanjing. And he has those German trained divisions I talked about are primarily stationed in that area. So again, there's a good reason for him to want to make this the key uh, event of this time frame. So Shanghai has other issues. It's a major business center. So the international community will see that Indeed, the Chinese are resisting the Japanese and uh, in force. And this is critical to Chang because, quite honestly, what he's hoping to do is he's always hoping to get more supplies, more support from the international community. He's also looking for the fact that perhaps at some point down the road, he will receive allies against the Japan, Japan from that international community. So it's very critical that he does this. But what is the Japanese goal here? Well, the Japanese, quite honestly, are, is this their goal is that this isn't a war. We're not fighting the nationalists. We're fighting these warlords and this disorganized thing that China is. It's not really a country. And they don't refer to it as a war. They refer to it as the North China Incident. What does that remind us of today, of what's going on in Ukraine? Quite similar in that regard. So Chang is going to make it clear, though, to the international community and to the world that it's going to be one war of resistance to the end. Kang Zhan de Odi. So indeed, he is making a key statement. But one last piece in regards to why this is the, going to be the first major battle is they are really want to make sure that the Japanese are under stress. Remember, all their troops and activity so far has been up in the north, up by Beijing. They're hoping that the Japanese will back down because the fact that they are now in a position where they have to fight away from there, and that will reduce their troop strength in Manchukuo, in Manchuria. And that's, of course, where the Russians are. So, indeed, there's another key factor in why this is going to be the first major battles of this war. And Japan is not in, in a position where they are willing to back down at all on this. Uh, they are, so they, ha they don't have troops really readily available. So they send in about two, 3,000 Japanese naval troops. And 
that decision is going to be a key piece because now the, the Chinese are going to respond to that. And Chang is going to send two of those German divisions I keep talking about into the city and to begin to fortify it. Well, they also make the decision, well, at this point, we outnumber these Japanese naval troops, so they're going to attack them. And there's a thing called the international community. I always talk about these legations in this class, but the international community has a settlement. This is forcing the Chinese to, nobody wants to, to fool with the settlement, by the way. That's totally, uh, that's going to cause an international incident. So they're channeled into predictable lanes of attack. And the Japanese, of course, have defended this quite aggressively. So this isn't going particularly well. The other thing that occurs is that the Japanese Navy, which is the third largest in the world, is also going to begin to shell the city to, to resist these attacks on the Japanese naval troops that are stationed here. So it's kind of growing. Look at it that way. It's, this thing is getting more and more out of control. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, okay. The Japanese are going to land two new divisions into this area. Uh, one of the divisions, these are infantry divisions, are going to land in the city itself to help protect the Japanese naval troops from being basically destroyed. And they're also going to land another division north of the city in an attempt to cut the city off. So they're going to try to make a drive from the north to the south to isolate the Chinese troops that are in this city. Well, the Japanese think, of course, that this is going to be a, another cakewalk. They believe fully this is going to end up like Beijing, and they're going to just go right in, and this is going to be over quickly. Remember, they told the emperor that this entire thing is only going to last two or three months. Well, that doesn't quite work out for them. Because if we look at this, and I think it's probably important that we eh, probably explain what these units are. I, I keep throwing these terms about divisions and this and that. And I think probably to understand what we're really talking about numerically and, and combat power-wise is important at this point. So a Japanese infantry division is an extremely large unit. Uh, they are 24,400 men approximately. Uh, U.S. Infantry Division in World War II is about 14,500. So it's a very, very big unit. It is armed with modern weaponry, uh, perhaps not as good as uh, a Western division would be, but indeed they have indigenous artillery. They have uh, some tanks. They have some armored cars. They've got, you know, artillery, mortars, machine guns, all that kind of stuff. So they're pretty well armed. But they also have a functional mobility that's superior to the Chinese. They have about 6,000 horses and about two to 300 trucks in order to move these large divisions around. Now, the, there's two types of Chinese division. I keep talking about the German divisions. We'll start with them. A Chinese German trained division has approximately 10,900 troops. They are also well armed. They are armed in an equivalent manner to the Japanese. So for their size, they've got the same amount of machine guns in proportion for artillery, etc. They are not nearly as mobile as the Japanese division. They only have maybe three, four hundred horses in order to move themselves around. They don't have a lot of trucks and things to, to move these divisions. So mobility is a major problem. There's another kind of division that is the vast majority of Chinese divisions. And these are divisions that are provided by warlords. And I will call these regional divisions. A regional division is poorly armed, is poorly trained. It's large, but it, it's not, has doesn't have a lot of effective combat power. It's And it's nearly immobile. They have almost no transportation. The other key factor with these types of divisions is simply this that whatever that warlord bought for those people to use to fight with, that's what they are armed with. So there's no unity in, in armament. So one guy, one division might have one kind of rifle, another will have another kind of rifle. The ammunition is not interchangeable. So the logistics problems of using these types of divisions is incredibly difficult. So 
when we look at the actual combat power of these units, a Japanese division is equivalent to a German trained Chinese division regiment. So a regiment of Japanese can take out an entire division of German trained Chinese. A regional division is only equivalent to a battalion of the Japanese division. So you can see there's a huge disparity in combat power between these units. So when I throw these numbers out, this division, that division, understand that this is not equivalent at all as far as combat power goes. Uh, uh, in the U.S. terms, it's one third of a regiment. So what's a regiment? In the U.S. terms, there's three regiments to a division. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, the, the Japanese have another huge advantage. And they are going to use poison gas and mustard gas in Shanghai against the Chinese. So the Chinese are ill-prepared for this onslaught of gas warfare. You can see in this picture, the Japanese infantry here is wearing gas masks. That's because they're using gas in these cities. Well, the Japanese division I said that landed up in the north, it's in a difficult situation because the terrain there is, is pretty difficult to advance in. And they're starting to, Chang is throwing in a few more troops and they're starting to take some very, very significant losses in these frontal attacks. The division that's landed in the city, what's fighting in a city? And it's pretty easy to defend a city because there's so many buildings and things. So it's hard for a unit to advance, particularly an inter, inter, infantry unit. So they're starting to suffer more and more casualties. Well, they are starting to win, though. And Chang makes a decision that he's going to go all in. He's going to take all his German units that are available, which is probably about 40,000 men, and he's going to supplement that with regional divisions, and they're going to come up with a force of 750,000 men defending Shanghai. The Japanese are not backing down. They're going to throw 250,000 men into this city. Shanghai becomes the largest urban battle of World War II before Stalingrad. That's how big this is. Let's put that into proportion for the United States. In 1945, in the Pacific Theater, we invade Okinawa. We invade Okinawa with 520,000 troops, and the Japanese are defending it with approximately 110,000 Japanese infantry and Okinawan conscripts. So you can see that the largest battle we had in World War II in the Pacific is not nearly as large as the Battle of Shanghai in 1937. So this is a gigantic battle. Well, it lasts for three months. Remember, they told the emperor this is all going to be over in three months. Well, it's not over. And the Japanese army is starting to take severe criticism worldwide. Remember, there's these international uh, groups. So there's reporting worldwide about what's going on in China all the time. Anytime they're in these cities near the coast, they're going to have this international community. And they are not defeating the Chinese. And the, the criticism becomes kind of almost ridiculous uh, as the Japanese response is going to be, well, you know, the Chinese are ignorant of tactics and they just don't know when to retreat. So <laughs> it's it's almost comical, uh, the, some of the responses Japan makes at this time. Uh, it's certainly not too comical to the Chinese, though. And if you look at this picture, I keep talking about German trained divisions. Notice that this machine gun nest, all those uh, soldiers, Chinese soldiers, are wearing German-style helmets. These units are equipped by Germany. Well, yeah, it's the battle is nearing its end. It's now late November. And the Chinese are finally basically forced to withdraw. They need to get out of Dodge. And they decide they're going to leave a German train division, the 88th Division, behind. And the division commander says, well, there's really no need to leave this entire division behind and have it destroyed. We're going to need it later on. Why don't we just leave a battalion behind? And the Chinese leadership agrees to this. They say, okay, that's fine. We're just going to leave a battalion. It's going to be the first battalion 
of the 88th Division. They're going to take up a position in the Shihang Warehouse, uh, or also known in the West as the Five Banks Warehouse. The Five Banks were five banks created this this building. So this building is the, almost the tallest building in the area. It is made out of concrete. So it's a natural fort, fortress. Uh, and it has another huge advantage in that it's directly across, as you can see in this map, from the international settlement. It's separated by a small creek. So there's two problems for the Japanese in this regard. First of all, they cannot use their naval artillery to bombard this fortress because it's too close to the international settlement and nobody wants an international incident. The second thing they can't do is they can't use poison gas because the entire uh, West and the news reporters, everybody will see that they're using poison gas in these cities, which they don't want anybody to see. So they, they've got a major problem with how this is going to go down. So this battalion is dug into this natural fortress, and the Japanese have no choice but to launch frontal attacks. And the frontal attacks are, are easily repulsed, I, I would say, and the Japanese are taking heavy casualties. Remember, there's like a division of Japanese trying to destroy one battalion of Chinese. And because it's right across from the international uh, uh, settlement, <laughs> there's actually Chinese and, and, and Westerners watching this like it's a, a football game. It's, I mean, they can literally see what's going on from directly across this little creek. And the Chinese are standing on the, on the sides, you know, in the settlement and cheering their troops on. And they're bringing food and things across this little creek to support them. And it, it, it's just an amazing uh, stand that these guys make. Uh, and so they hold out for seven days against this giant uh, Japanese force. Again, it puts a lot of shame on the Japanese that they're having so much difficulty taking this. And it becomes a giant morale boost for the Chinese people. It, it, it really is a, a, we would look at it like, the uh, World War I standpoint, like the Lost Battalion, or in World War II, the paratroopers at Bastong fighting against the Germans. This has the same piece in China, and even today. In 2020, they make a major motion picture about this. The Chinese government offers some financial aid and support for this project. In fact, if you'd like to see this movie, it is on Amazon Prime. It's called the 800, because, of course, it's talking about the 800 heroes, much like, again, our movies about Bastong, for example. So you can see this movie. It's supposed to be quite good. I have not seen it, but uh, it's, it's a major production. What's different today, though, you would have not seen this movie made particularly in the past and made such a big deal and supported by the Chinese government because they always portrayed the war as the Chinese communists won the war. Now they've turned around and now they're willing to support the nationalist Chinese and show their participation in the war and the key participation that indeed they'd made. And it goes back to our first class when I talked about how we look at World War II as a patriotic event. It gives pride to us. The Chinese are starting to see that as an advantage as well for them, that this they can leverage the, uh, the, the war in World War II as something that is a patriotic event and to build national spirit for their people. So a huge, huge event uh, in this uh, battle. Well, like I said, it gets on to the end of November. The Japanese are starting to win. The Chinese are running out of ammunition, et cetera. And the Chinese have inflicted in immense casualties on the Japanese at this point. But the Japanese have an opportunity or an option that the J Chinese do not have. And they can fill their ranks with conscripts, poorly trained, but at least they can arm them. They have the indigenous capability to, to create armaments. The Chinese have far less capability to create armaments. And so 
the Japanese, even though the troops aren't well trained, or at least they have weapons. The Chinese are running out of weapons because the only thing they can get comes from the West or Soviet Union. So they're they're really at a huge disadvantage there. Well, total casualties for this battle over three months, there's 187,200 Chinese casualties. Japanese casualties are said to be 18,500 dead, 35,000 wounded. No one actually knows because the Japanese have stopped giving out information about their casualties in their own country, much like Putin today is not telling the Russian people the amount of casualties they're receiving in the Ukraine, or Ukraine, excuse me. So no one really knows for sure what the Japanese total casualties are in this thing, but you can see these casualties are gigantic for the, uh, 1937. And Chang has other problems too, though. He's lost the, almost all his German trained divisions. Remember, they only started with 80,000 troops. And he's lost 70% of his academy-trained officers. So when they're trying to reconstitute their military forces, this is going to be a huge problem for Chang. He doesn't have an indigenous weapons capability, and he's lost so many trained soldiers in this battle. But they've done one thing. They have shown the world that the century of humiliation is over, and they are going to stand up to Japan. Well, both sides are pretty beat up after this, and the Imperial Japanese Army says to General Matsui, who's in charge of the Japanese forces here, he goes, well, you know, what you need to do right now is we need to stay in Shanghai and regroup because we've had all these casualties. Matsui says, no, don't want to do that. We've got the Chinese on the run. And I know what's best for Japan. And the best thing for us to do now is to immediately attack the city of Nanking because that is the capital of the Chinese nationalists. And once we capture that capital, they will be forced to surrender. And so it's a, once again, and by the end of this class, believe me, you'll all know what the word Gekko Kujo means, is that simply... He is going to override his orders, and he is going to make this pursuit of the Chinese on his own authority. Always a strange aspect of Japanese military. Well, I said they're in poor condition, and the some of his German advisors and Chang's top military leaders say, look it, we can't defend Nanking. This, the town is it's indefensible because of the terrain also, it backs up on a river. So if we're if the Japanese surround this city, we have no way to retreat. And our units that go into this city are going to be destroyed. So we should not defend Nanking. We should just continue to pull out. Chang makes a very key decision and says, no, if we don't defend Nanking, the Chinese people will lose morale. And we that's the most important thing he believes at this point is that they need to unify the country under nationalist rule. And if they just give up the capital, indeed, that's going to be a disaster for the morale of the Chinese people. Well, <clears throat> the Japanese have 50,000 troops that are coming towards, again, it's 170 miles away. They don't have the logistics capability to fight in this battle really and so what they're going to do is they're going to start living off the land on their way to attack nanking the chinese try to put up some resistance between these two cities but it's it's token at best so think about this horde of japanese fifty thousand troops living off the land and moving towards nanking the chinese only have twenty thousand effective troops left to defend this city again they're not as well armed because they're running out of stuff and these troops are going to be trapped in Nanking, which is indeed what happens. They can't resist 50,000 Japanese. They know that if they try to surrender, that the Japanese will kill them. And so what they begin to do is they begin to strip off their uniforms, throw away their weapons, and indeed try to blend in with the population. Well, that's a problem. Because the Japanese 
Now they don't know who's a soldier and they don't know who's a civilian. And they begin to round up any man of military age and execute them. And this will be known as the Rape of Nanking. There's an international settlement under a German businessman named John Raba. And he is trying to protect the Chinese people in this city. And this goes on for six weeks. Now, casualty figures, you can read one book, they'll say 50,000 Chinese were killed by the Japanese in the city. You'll read another book, uh, particularly The Rape of Nanking, where they'll say there's 300,000 Chinese were executed Thousands of women were raped and murdered by the Japanese as well. No one really ever knows what these numbers are. But what they do know is that this did occur because Raba and this international community are showing the world that this is the bestiality of the Japanese army in this city. So the entire world is aware of the rape of Nanking at this time. There's no, they can't hide it. And the Japanese troops are, have really gotten completely out of control. And again, Raba does everything he can, but there's only so much that this little community can do to try to protect people. So again, it's a, it's a terrible, terrible disaster. Well, why does this stuff occur? Why do we see Japan act in this way? Part of the reason at this point of the war is, again, this is not a war. It's a North China incident. Of course, it's not in North China anymore, but it's still the North China incident. And we see what they do in 1894-95 against the Chinese. They're relatively benign, not on Formosa, of course, but indeed, generally, they're well-behaved. 1904-1905 in the Russian War, they are particularly well-behaved. Some would say that they were better behaved than the Russians. Uh, in 1904, 1905. And we see is also in World War I, when they capture the Germans at Tsingtao, they treat those Germans relatively well. All of this is because these were declared wars. Well, they didn't declare a war here. And so that changes things. So the, the their army ministry says out this, it says, it is inappropriate to act strictly in accordance with the various stipulations and treaties and practices governing land warfare. Matsui, who I just talked about, leading the, the, the force into Nanjing goes, and this is in October when they're still fighting in Shanghai, he goes, to those who bear arms against Japan, the Japanese army will show no mercy. So they have made it clear that they are going to follow international law and they are going to have summary executions of Chinese soldiers. Of course, that expands when they take off their uniforms. And now it's Chinese citizens. Well, I think there's four key factors here. And this expands during World War II. The Japanese have an atrocious uh, record in World War II treating civilians and prisoners of war even though that's now a declared war. And I think it comes to this. Japanese troops throughout World War II are never adequately supplied. So they're always living off the land. Living off the land means there's going to be abuses against civilians. You're going to take their food. You're going to take their houses. You're going to do whatever you can to survive at their expense. Number one problem. Number two is physical abuse in the Japanese army itself. It's completely common for a Japanese officer to beat a junior officer. It's completely common for that junior officer to beat a non-commissioned officer. It's completely common for a non-commissioned officer to beat his troops. And I don't mean a slap of the hand. I mean hitting people with sticks and batons. Discipline is incredibly harsh in the Japanese military, Navy and Army. And so we see that these people are willing to inflict that same type of discipline and pain on people that they feel are below them. And by the 1930s, number three, the Japanese are totally inculcated that they will never surrender. This has not always been the case in Japan, but by this time it is. So since they will never surrender, they would rather die than surrender. Indeed, they have the situation where 
if you surrender, you're beneath contempt. So I don't have to take treat you nice because you're not worth treating nice because you surrendered. So then you're a problem there. And finally, number four, in regards to rapes, the physical abuse of women was extremely common in Japan. So they have no background really to say that, well, we should not rape and pillage women. And, and they do that throughout World War II. So I think that's the four key pieces here of Japanese misbehavior throughout the entire time of World War II. Well, <clears throat> with the loss of Shang Shanghai and Nanjing, uh, there's some consideration by the Chinese and by the Japanese to end this situation. Remember, this is we've had all these huge casualties, all this fighting, there's all this expense going on. And I think this is probably the last opportunity for Japan to avoid what will become the quagmire of their uh, intervention in China. Remember, this is going to go from 1937 to 1945. So this is a very, very long, long event. And so this is, the I think, the last chance. And because everybody's getting, even though it's it, Shanghai has just fallen, people are getting tired. Well, again, when Matsui moves towards Nanjing, and when he moves into Nanjing and they have the Nanjing massacre, we begin to see that this is causing the Chinese people to be terrified of the Japanese, and with good reason. So when the Japanese advance, the Chinese civilians all begin to run to the hills because they know that there's going to be problems. There's going to be terror, basically, caused by the Japanese. So that's going to impede the ability to have some media mediation here. So keep that in mind a little bit. Um, remember, the Japanese felt that their goal was to liberate China from Western influence under the benevolent rule of the emperor. That's, that's always their thinking. Unfortunately, because of their behavior, the Japanese uh, are so bad that the Chinese never see it that way they just see the japanese as another imperialist intruder which really in a lot of ways they are uh, they uh, there's there's really no question of that with their bad behavior so they can have more issues of why they're having trouble getting together at this point as well and there's two key factions in 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 the japanese military there's a faction called the imperial way and the imperial way faction believes in spiritualism and they think that the military of Japan will become invincible because of the spiritual aspects of its military. They are willing to attack in the face of uh, insurmountable odds, regardless of being killed. They will not surrender. So the Imperial Way faction thinks that industrialization at this point isn't really that critical. Uh, and they are also the group that wanted to invade Manchuria because they think the biggest foe of Japan is the Soviet Union and communism. They think that they should, at this point, begin to pull out of China and focus on the key enemy that is known as the Soviet Union. You may remember uh, uh, Mr. Ishiwara here. At the time, he was a colonel. He is the guy that tried to blow up the Manchurian Railroad in 1931. Didn't do a very good job, as you may remember. Uh, and uh, he is leading this faction to pull out of China. There's another faction, and that's called the control faction. The control faction has a, a very different view of the world. They think that Japan needs to become a world power by getting as much natural resources as they possibly can. And at that point, once they build themselves up with tanks and more planes and, and more ships, because they achieved all this industrial power, that indeed, then they will be prepared to, to take on the Soviets and the world, of course. So big difference there. But their goal is not to go into Manchukuo and fight the Russians. Their goal is to go south because they want to capture a thing they refer to as the Southern Resource Area. And that Southern Resource Area is, of course, 
Malaysia, Indonesia, where there's oil, there's rubber, there's tin, there's all these resources. And so the control faction has a very, very different worldview from the Imperial Way faction. But they eventually want to go after the communists too. Don't get me wrong. Well, this leads us to the Germans. And the Germans are always playing pretty much a role in, in, in this area too, which I think is kind of interesting. We probably don't think about this. But the Germans, they've got a, a, a vested interest in stopping this war because they want the Imperial Way faction to be a counter to the Soviet Union. And so they have their ambassador, Mr. Oscar Trautmann, and he is going to try to broker a peace settlement. And the idea here is that there are some Chinese that are willing to consider peace at this time. And with the, all the defeats the Chinese have had, there, there's uh, perhaps an opportunity here. And so Trautmann goes to the Japanese, particularly the uh, Ishiwara group, he goes, well, what are we looking for in this war? And they sent out a group of proposals. One of the proposals is that, indeed, there will be a neutral zone. Remember the uh, previous Tangu truce. And that neutral zone, though, this time will be controlled by the Chinese, not by the Japanese. There will be uh, other concessions, but they're relatively minor. But one of the key concessions, of course, is going to be that the Chinese have to agree to be to stop trading and be against the Soviet Union. So they have to basically form a pact that will be against communism. But it's not outrageous what the Japanese are asking for here. It, it's, it's certainly shameful. It it's certainly doesn't end the century of humiliation, but it's, it's much more doable than what's going to happen next because... The control faction says, no, mm -mm. this is totally unacceptable. We're not going to accept this, this peace at all. We need to get far more out of this. And what they're saying is that, well, there'll be a neutral zone, all right, but we're going to control that. Uh, there's going to be a, a free trade agreement. So China is going to give Japan most favored nation status. They are going to take the city of Shanghai, and they're going to have that be a neutral zone, of course, under Japanese control. And very, very important, they are going to demand reparations from China to pay for this war. So it's going to be at China's expense, once again, that this war was, you know, basically their fault. Another unequal treaty. Yes, Ellen. Um, what was negotiating for China here? Was this the nationalists? Yes, the nationalists. Okay. Yes. We're going to get there. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the Kanoe government, and this guy is always a problem, believe me. <laughs> we'll talk about Kanoe a lot. Uh, he basically says that the control faction is correct and he supports them. Well, Chang can't possibly accept this. It's totally ridiculous. Uh, it's going to, if they accept this proposal, once again, it reduces China to basically a uh, puppet state. And so you got that problem going. And you got, you know, that Kanoe says, well, you know, if you don't give up and agree to this by January 11th, remember the start of, I believe, in October, that we're not going to talk to you anymore. You're not going to be the legitimate government of China, the nationalists. We won't. We don't need you guys. You know, we'll talk to somebody else that will agree to our 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 goals. And so that's what is going to happen. He basically says that if you don't agree, and of course Chang cannot agree to this, that we are going to find somebody else to talk to. Well, what this has done is this is now committed China and Japan to this very long war. There was an opportunity here, I believe. But indeed, that opportunity is now gone. But the Japanese are going to find someone to talk to. In the United States or in Europe, when we think of Quisling, we think of Traitor, named after the Norwegian 
uh, uh, guy who took over after the Nazis uh, invaded and became a puppet government to the Germans in Norway. And so Quisling has become a term we're familiar with. The United States, if somebody's a traitor, we might call him a Benedict Arnold. If you go to China, Taiwan or mainland, communist or nationalist, if you want to say traitor, you say Wang Jingwei. Wang Jingwei is indeed considered by the Ch all Chinese to be a traitor. And Wang's a very, I think, interesting character. I mean, he's got, he's an ardent nationalist. He's a tremendous public speaker. Uh, he's considered to be extremely handsome. Uh, he is a notable figure. Uh, before the Qing uh, rebellion, he attempts to assassinate a Qing prince. He's captured and he's sentenced to death and he's imprisoned. While he's in prison waiting for his execution, the rebellion succeeds and he's freed from prison. He is now a national hero. He gets in with Sun Yat-sen and he is perhaps Sun Yat-sen's closest advisor. So remember, Sun Yat-sen is significantly socialist. And at this time, Wang Jingwei is significantly socialist. Upon Sun's death, the natural successor to Sun is considered to be Wang Jingwei. Unfortunately for him, he doesn't get that position. It goes to Chiang Kai-shek. And he always resents this for the rest of his times. He's always... He's always going to be a part of Chang's government, uh, in and out, but he is also going to be uh, a problem and always resents the fact that he's not the leader of the nationals. I said he had strong socialist leanings, but he goes away from this. He starts to, to see that, and Chang as well, they see that communism is bad. They think communism is terrible. They're very, they become very anti-communist. He becomes so anti-communist that by the mid-30s, he wants China to join the Comintern Pact, which I talked about last week. Would he be considered to be the uh, uh, loyal uh, opposition to the government? He was loyal to the cause, but he was sort of swimming upstream. You could, if you want to view him as a loyal opposition, I would say that's probably more extreme than I would go with uh, in, in his regard. Remember, he's going to be a traitor, okay? So he doesn't... That's yet to come. It's, uh, real soon. We'll get there in about two minutes. So anyway, uh, so he, he is uh, very much against what's going on at this point in the war. Remember, they've been kicked out of Shanghai. They've been kicked out of Nanking. They are going to be kicked out of Wuhan, and now they're going to be all the way into Chongqing, which we'll get to again, too. But so the war is not going particularly well for China. All right. And he feels that maybe what they need to do is they need to make peace with the Japanese. And he in 1938, he literally bolts from Chongqing, leaves the government and escapes to Hanoi. And when he's in Hanoi, uh, the nationalists attempt to assassinate him. They nearly succeed. He's badly wounded. Three months later, he goes from Hanoi to Shanghai. And he's going to recreate his own government under Japanese, a puppet government, called the Reorganized National Government of the Republic of China. So he is basically thrown in with the Japanese. Remember, he is anti-communist. He's been in Europe. He's hanging around with Hitler. Uh, he becomes pretty much uh, proto-fascist, I guess would be the best way to view him. So he's going to go so far as to, as to sign a peace treaty on behalf of China, even though he doesn't really represent most of China. And he's going to join the tripartite pact to join with the Nazis and the Japanese uh, against the, the West. So we see that indeed, this guy is a traitor, okay? And so when you go to China, if you ever go to China, you want to say traitor, just say Wang Jingwei. Well, remember, the Chinese have lost Nanjing, their capital. And Chang makes this statement. He goes, 
The outcome of this war will not be decided at Nanking or in any other big city. It will be decided in the countryside of our vast country and by the inflexible will of our people. In the end, we will wear the enemy down. In time, the enemy's military might will count for nothing. I can assure you that final victory will be ours. Very bold statement after these losses. And the Chinese continue to withdraw. They first withdraw to Wuhan, and then they further withdraw to Chongqing. And remember when I told you he was building infrastructure between 32 and 37? What is he doing? He's building railroads and roads that will lead to the interior of China because he knows that they need a place where they can continue to fight from. He builds infrastructure that will allow China to fight a long war. And Chang gets, I think, a pretty bad reputation. Uh, we think of him as the guy that lost China to the communists. And his government was corrupt and, and all these things. But as a personal leader, he demonstrates a lot of bravery. Probably more so than any other world leader at that time. And I'll give you a couple of examples. He stays in Nanking right before the fall, flies out. He's in Wuhan with the troops, flying in and out, always under danger. Other key Japanese or Chinese cities, he's always there at the front with his troops. Very bold leadership. It's kind of like looking at if Winston Churchill had gone to Dunkirk. It's kind of like if FDR had flown into Manila before Manila falls in 1942. So I think Chang is he's he's a he's a brave man. He's not a weakling by any means. Perhaps a bit murderous, but <laughs> not a weakling. Uh, and with that said, let us take a very short break. I mean short. I got a lot to go here. Are we back yet? No. <laughs> Soon <laughs> I felt obligated after last week to give people a break. I think it was the same thing as that man had voted for that it's a statement. 300,000 is a lot of people. I think it's a lot of people. Ask for themselves. But these are supposedly yeah. troops that know what they're doing. And they're 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 um, it's scary to me. It's scary to me as the vote is more serious. Yeah. Because once yeah. they agree yeah. to that vote, yeah. um, he'll make the same thing as Hitler did with the state plan. These are Germans. Sure. These are rifles. They, they want us. us. Yeah. 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 And so want us to be this. They want us to be this. That's a very good question because once that happens, that becomes part of Russia. That is where war. No longer the But interestingly, Erdogan, China, all the missions are not going to get out of those nice little back the French East. Apparently, Modi in particular is starting to back away. One more question. I think we're just talking about here, man. You're putting up here the grandfather of the people who are living here today. So they're these people are influenced by their parents. That's a case of the Chinese Chinese nowadays. Uh, 
Yeah, it's world day. This kind of thing is still there. It's still there. They're I'm usually pretty tired. Now. <laughs> You're involved. Particularly all the non English names people from pronunciation. Not as far as you think. think that X is a CH sound position and uh C and X is going to be like a PX SH sound and C and Q is a CH sound. It looks like the queen would be the champion. It looks like like the president of uh the year of trying to today XI and then I'll say that's a that's a named after Germans because the Germans control that town all right gang I need to start up again because I got a lot of ways to go here and I'm trying to be respectful of your time as best I can be my suspicion is I will not finish this on time but I'm going to do my best all right so we have the situation where the the Japanese are continuing to press against the Chinese they press a little too far they extend themselves too far and they take a little bloody nose at this town of Tiazer Huang or I can't even try to pronounce that really uh and and that is the first major defeat that the Japanese will suffer in this war remember they've already taken Shanghai and Nanjing and they're continuing to press further inland then they're going to take the uh key city of Zhuzhou once they take that there's nothing in their way between that city and Wuhan. Now, Wuhan has become the new capital. They've evacuated as much industry as they possibly could from Nanjing and Shanghai to Wuhan. There's nothing in their way now. And they need time in order to evacuate further inland to Chongqing, or Chongqing as we see it here. So you see all the way on the right of the map, you see Shanghai. And Nanjing, you see in the middle, Wuhan with the dark underline. And then you see Chongqing with the red circle. That's the areas we're talking about. We're going to talk about another area too, though, because nothing's standing in their way. Chang makes perhaps one of the most momentous decisions he'll ever make. Uh, and that is he is going to breach the Yellow River in order to slow the Japanese down so he can evacuate the city of Wuhan. If you look at the map again and you see those little circle of red dots, that is the area he's going to flood. Note that the difference between Shanghai and Nanjing is 170 miles. That is a big flood. And this is some of the most critical farmland in china but he makes this decision and this is a it's going to have terrible consequences because the yellow river is known as china's sorrow it frequently floods over the centuries and the chinese have put 
centuries of work creating dikes and to control this river. This is always considered a key function that they have to control this river. This river actually at points flows above the adjacent ground. I've actually seen that in Europe. It's a little disconcerting to see a river that's above the, the flow of the ground next to it. But indeed, that is how this thing has been built. And he's going to breach it. And not only is he going to breach it, but he's going to breach it when it's at an incredibly high point. And you can see in this picture what this looks like. And when he breaches this thing, it's going to be a big problem. Now, the farmers nearby are about to harvest their crops. They don't want to leave. And they tell them, look, you got to get out of Dodge here. And some of them actually do leave. But those that are further down the river and further south, they're not going to leave. They're not even told. And all of a sudden, the next thing they know is they're starting to drown. And when he breaches this thing, it's going to be a catastrophe of unimaginable proportions. It's okay, so they breach it. It's high. It tears even more infrastructure out when it's breached. It starts to spread silt all over all this farmland. It destroys all the infrastructure in this huge area that they have built for centuries, okay? And this farmland is going to take many, many years to recover, so much so that it's not repaired until 1947. So the losses here, and these are the, the low estimate, 500,000 dead Chinese. 500,000 Chinese are forced to flee from this area. It is the single largest ecological disaster of World War II takes place because of him opening that river. Unfortunately, it only slows the Japanese a little bit. And the Japanese are, of course, blamed for this by the Chinese people. But the Chinese people also blame the nationalists. So when we look at this event, this is going to be a natural recruitment area for the communists in World War II and post-war. And this is going to help them eventually take over China because of some of these disasters. And Chang is doing what he thought was right. But indeed, this one is going to be a problem. Well, let's talk a little bit about Japanese terror bombing. And the Japanese have gone so far as to uh, remember in 1932, uh, they have invaded Manchuria. Well, again, there were incidents in Shanghai. And in 1932, they literally bombed the city of Shanghai and caused thousands of casualties. Remember, this is five years before Guernica. So the Japanese are going to become and are, indeed, the world leaders in terror bombing. Uh, and I... I, I hesitate to show this picture because it's such a terrible picture but this picture was shown internationally of this burned and terrified chinese baby in shanghai uh, this was in august of 37. Uh, so the world knows that indeed this is the kind of behavior the japanese are are doing and another thing we need to think about at this time and this is we don't see it this way. Things have changed so much. I mean, we're used to a bombings every day, every day really. There's, uh, you know, the, in Ukraine, there's a rocket attack or there's a bombing attack, and we're just used to this. In the 30s, they saw aerial bombardment more like we would see today use of nuclear weapons. They believe, many people believe, that indeed aerial bombardment would be the end of civilization. So this has this resonates incredibly with the international community when the Japanese begin to do these atrocities. So and the Japanese are pretty much straightforward about it. They admit it. Uh, this comes from Frank uh, Richard Frank's Tower of Skulls book, which I highly recommend that and any of his books, actually. Um, that this is the first in history in which the attacker admitted the purpose of forcing a national surrender by terrorizing civilians. They are blatant about what they're doing. They're going to try to make the Japanese people, excuse me, the Chinese people surrender because of bombardment. So and everybody was all in uproar about it. 
but that's 32, and now they're fighting the full war, 37, five years, they, people just ignore it? Oh, no, 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 I didn't mean that. This is in 37. Well, because up there, top says in 30. We're getting there. <laughs> okay. This this is just the first bombing was in 32. That's what I'm saying, but all this, this outrage. The outrage continues. It continues, but... Nobody did anything is what I'm saying. Well, I, I agree with that. The, the the international community is very lax in this regard. There's no question there. And I'll, I'll kind of show you some of that too. But the point is that they are really the first to try to do this and admit to doing it. That's kind of the key piece. And it does create an international uproar. And in, for example, we'll see that they start to bomb the city of Chongqing in 38. Uh, and they will bomb that city over the course of the war 268 times. Uh, they will drop 3,000 tons of bombs. It will kill approximately 10,000 Chinese civilians and wound an additional 30,000. So we see that this will be an ongoing issue. And again, the international grief, FDR makes a big point of this, I believe in 38 or 39, uh, that this kind of bombing needs to stop worldwide. So uh, Chang makes a statement again, and I keep using stuff from his diary, and I think it's critical. And he goes, after witnessing the bombing on May 4th, this is the first big bombing of Chongqing, he writes, and remember, he's a Christian. He goes, God lives. Why does he not bring some disaster on our enemies? Well, indeed, in 1945, there will be some disaster on the Japanese. So, but again, this is the first major terror bombing well before Guernica is going on in this, in this area. It's going to bring us to this incident with the Pan A. Remember, I've told you about the legations. We have China Marines stationed in, in China. We have gunboats in China. And the Pan A is trying to evacuate from Shanghai area with three tankers and some civilians. And it's attacked by Imperial Japanese naval aircraft. And it is sunk. Uh, the Japanese go, hey, you know, we're really sorry. We didn't mean to do this. We didn't know it was a U.S. ship. If we had, we never would have done this. And they pay a $2 million indemnity. And, of course, they are issue a formal apology. Well. According to John Prados, uh, intelligence historian, we had some capabilities to read Japanese naval codes at this time. Some. Keep that in mind. Not a lot. And it's he believes that, indeed, we had read their codes, knew that this attack was indeed perpetrated intentionally. It was not an accident. And... Of course, we can never admit that to the Japanese because we can't let that secret out that we have broken some of their codes. So indeed, this will change U.S. opinion, not just the public's opinion, but the United States government's opinion as well. And we're going to see that right now, what that leads to. And this is going to lead to beginnings of massive aid to China from not just the Soviet Union, but they are the biggest single providers. They give the Chinese $250 million worth of war aid, which in 1937 dollars is a lot of money. They are also going to basically give them an air force. Like we are going to try to create an air force in China in 1941 with the Flying Tigers. The Russians are there much sooner. They send in planes and pilots and ground crew and fight the Japanese directly. They're not really Soviets anymore. They're Chinese now. So, but indeed, they are Russians. And Russia sees this, of course, as a way to keep Japan busy so there will never be a two-front war. They always their goal is to keep Japan fighting in China or keep Japan away from Manchuria and Vladivostok in, the, in Siberia. They know that's a problem, and they are going to do everything they can to prevent that for as long as possible. Well, the Panay incident will change our opinion, and the British as well, and the rape of Nanking, and all these bad propaganda issues that the Japanese are, are subjecting themselves to because of their terrible behavior. And we are now going to start shipping 10,000 tons of war materials and aid to China through Haiphong Harbor 
in what we know today as North Vietnam, which is Northern Indochina at this time. So we are starting to give them more and more aid. By 1939, the British initially begin to back off of this because they could see war clouds coming in Europe. And so they're getting concerned that the Japanese will cause trouble in Asia that will for force them to divert resources to protect areas like Malaysia and Singapore. And the United States at this time continues to sell things to the Japanese. Uh, we extend a trade agreement that's been there for six months by an additional six months. So quite honestly, if you look at this, we're giving aid to China on one hand, but we're selling Japan the bulk of their oil and scrap metal at the same time. So we're, the United States is really playing kind of both sides of the fence on this one because we're, we're supporting the Japanese war effort and supporting the Chinese warfare effort at the same time same time at this in 1939 certainly uh that will change <laughs> so when we look at the war in china from 1937 until 1941 for that four-year period the japanese have a huge investment here and have had terrible losses they have 185,647 recorded dead they have 520,000 wounded they have 430,000 sick. So they have over a million casualties in that four year period fighting in China. Yes, Jim? Do you any particular sickness that they have? Uh, there's a lot of stuff in North China. I think typhoid is one of the more common at that point. I would say it was mostly typhoid. I, I, I could research that, but I'm not positive. Not COVID 19. No, not COVID 19. <laughs> that hadn't been invented yet. Is an issue now? Always. Always an issue. Uh, but not for the, so much for the Japanese. They would take whatever they want. So, what about the Chinese? Well, I've changed these figures uh, downward. Uh, you can see numbers much higher than this. But I will say at this point, the Chinese have lost 14 million dead, civilian and military. Uh, and 90 million Chinese have fled from the Japanese. So we see a huge movement of the population trying to escape from Japanese. And when we look at this map, I've put it in two circles to see the difference between pre-1940 and post-1940. All that area in those two circles is post-1937. So before 1937, they had Manchuria and Korea, for example, that's on this map. But that's the area that they've gained. That is a gigantic area of territory that they now is controlled primarily by the Japanese. So we can see that China has paid a tremendous price in this war by 1940. Well, I keep talking about that. Imperial Wei faction and that uh, Kwantung army, and I can't. Is there a question? In this time, the Nationalist Army is much larger. Uh, as 1940s, we go into 1942, 45, the Chinese. Communist army will become much larger. Uh, but to put it this way, uh, and I didn't include the slide, but I'll, I'll try to take the time to talk about this. All right, since you brought this question up. The Chinese communists only launch one offensive in the entire war, and that is in 1940, and that's the 100 Battalion Offensive. It's a complete disaster. And, and Mao and the Chinese communists never again launch an offensive, a conventional military offensive throughout the entire rest of the war up to 1945. So they do indeed have numerous guerrilla warfare activities, but the bulk of the war, it's fought in a conventional manner, is certainly fought by the nationalists, not by the Chinese communists. 
In fact, their participation, like I said, is only really one major offensive in the entire war. So Mao is being very cagey here, and he's husbanding his forces for the day when he will go to fight the nationalists and take the country. So that's kind of the best answer I can give you. Is that good? Okay, so the plan for the Kwantung army is always to take Siberia. Remember, they controlled Siberia from 1918 to 1922 when they were forced to give it back at the Washington Naval uh, Treaty and uh, the Nine Power Treaty. Well, they really want it back again. And in the interim, at this point, the Soviets have created this thing called the Mongolian People's Republic. It's a communist state in Mongolia. Again, the Japanese, they don't like communists, believe me. So they definitely want to stop this. Another key factor is, and I've talked about where Vladivostok is right by Japan there in Siberia, they're afraid that the Russian submarines will begin to interdict their trade. They're also afraid that the Russians will start to bomb Japan in a future war. So it's critical for the Japanese to feel that they need to capture this area to push the Soviets further away from the homeland, from the Japanese main islands. And that's always what they're looking for. So this is actually a plan that the, the Kwantung army had developed to capture this area that they had given up, basically the same area in 1922. So Kwantung army is going to start a Put a little pressure on the Russians, kind of see what's going on, you know, see if we can maybe, you know, see how tough they are. So they start having a few incidents and they're willing to see if the Russians can really defend the East here. And like I said, their eventually plan is to capture all of this area. And why do they think they can do that at this time, even though they're fighting in China? They think that they can do this at this time because Stalin has purged his military. Germans think similar things. And because he's purged his military, they believe that maybe this is a good time to consider getting back Siberia because we really like Siberia. It's a little cold, but, you know, but we had a good time there. You know, we met a lot of nice Russian girls and it was, you know, it was good there. So, they really wanted to go back into this area. Well, that is going to cause what I think is one of the most critical battles of World War II that probably hardly anybody knows about. And that is the Battle of Kalkingol. And in Russia, you would never call it Kalkingol. You would call it Nomahan. And actually, there's a little museum there about this battle. It's not a big museum. And it's certainly not a big area. It's in the middle of Mongolia. From what I've heard is you don't want to use the bathroom, okay? Just so you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, so this fighting continues to escalate between these the Kwantung army and and the uh, the Russians, and the, the Japanese decide to launch a two division attack across the Kalkingol. Kalkingol is a river, and this is a disputed area in Mongolia. So. The Japanese are repulsed, but are still on the other side of the river. And a stalemate begins. And the Russians are going to respond pretty aggressively to this. And they're going to send a guy named Georgi Zhukov. You may be familiar with Georgi because he is the victor at Stalingrad and also the guy that captures Berlin in 1945. So he's fairly competent, I would say, when it comes to military commanders. And they begin to heavily reinforce Georgie's army. The Japanese don't believe that they can do this because remember, the Japanese are always poor on infrastructure. And because they're so poor on infrastructure, they always think you have to have a railhead, a railroad really close to where you're going to have a battle. And they have one just on the other side of Kalkangol. The nearest Russian railhead is 400 plus miles away. And they cannot believe that the Russians can launch an assault of any major proportion in this area. They are so wrong because the Russians bring in a couple thousand trucks uh, <laughs> and they are going to help Zhukov build this really good mobile army. 
One thing also that occurs at this time is the Imperial Japanese Army Air Force begins to bomb Russian air bases in Russia. It's not in Mongolia anymore. It's now become an issue with Russia itself. And the Japanese army back in Japan is like, dudes, would you please stop this? You're going to cause a lot of problems. Don't do this. And the Japanese Kwantung army basically starts to back away a little bit from these aviation attacks. Well, Is this Gekko Kujo? Yeah, it's Gekko Kujo. Like I said, we'll keep, I've got more Gekko Kujo coming. Trust me, there's plenty of it. Um, so Zhukov launches this big attack, and he uses the same tactics he's going to use at Stalingrad. He encircles the Japanese and destroys an entire Japanese division. I mean, wipes it out. Well, it's going to be the largest tank battle in history at this time. So you can see here a picture of a destroyed Japanese tank, uh, and the Russians are kind of looking it over. But what's, what's really going to show us is that the Russians are far more mobile. Uh, they have superior tanks. They have superior technology as far as mobility goes that the Japanese just can't match. And what that's going to lead to, of course, is, is the Kwantung army is going to start to back away. They see it. Hey, wow. You know, we thought that our spirituality could defeat technology. <laughs> Apparently, it's not working out so well. So maybe the Russians are a little too tough. Maybe we should start looking south, kind of, kind of like, you know, what those control guys that we don't like very much are talking about. But maybe it would be a better idea to... Well, maybe leave those Russians alone because uh, we just got our butt kicked. And they they are forced to do that. Remember at this time, this is key to this whole World War II piece, is the Russians have forged a pact with the Germans. This is in August of 1939. In September of 1939, the Germans attacked Poland. One day after Zhukov's victory at Nomohan, the Soviet Union attacks Poland a couple of weeks after the Germans. So we see now that Germany and the Soviets are linked, tempor very temporarily, but they're linked. And this is going to cause major thought process by the Japanese. Well, we get into 1940. In May of 1940, May 10th to be exact, the Germans attack the French. They defeat the French in six weeks. They are now the masters of Europe. The only thing standing in their way in Europe is Britain. Because remember, the Soviet Union is still their ally. So Japanese see this as well. You know, the Vichy government of France, well, they're pretty weak right now. and Maybe we need to have a little chat with them. So they say, okay, what we're going to do is, we're, you know, all those other countries are sending armaments through Haiphong Harbor into China. We need to stop that because we're at war with China. We, well, we're sort of at war with China. And we need to cut that out. And, you know, the Vichy government, you guys need to help us. And what we will we propose is we'll just kind of take over North Vietnam or North Indochina. And the French are like, well, you know, you know, this isn't now, yeah, maybe we'll think about it. And once again, Gecko Cujo shows up and a <laughs> the Chinese army without authority marches in and begins to fight the French in North Indochina. Well, everybody backs off really quick on this. And the officer in charge gets a little slap on the hand. But the French acquiesced to 40,000 Japanese troops being in North Indochina at this time and shutting down the porch of Haiphong. So again, nobody can ship weapons to the Chinese through what we know as North Vietnam. The United States is getting a little tired of this. 
um, we are starting to understand that we need to keep China in the war. And at this point, we say, okay, no more scrap metal, Japan. And oh, by the way, you can't use your the, the Panama Canal for your shipping. This was in September, it was just exactly in September of 40, but the US did that, or was it a little later? Just a tad later. Okay. Just a tad later. I can't tell you if it was exactly October, but it's right in that range. It's it's late 1940. It didn't take them long once that happened. To... Well, because there's going to be another event, and we're going to talk about that right now, and that's going to be called the Tripartite Pact. And oh, as you probably know from watching numerous uh, presentations about World War II, and I'm going to follow this strictly, is mandatory that all presentations of World War II at some point have a picture of Hitler. And indeed, this is your chance. There he is. I got a little yellow arrow there. You can see where Hitler is. So I've fulfilled my duty as a military historian on World War II by showing you a picture of Hitler. That'll probably be the last time. So going to form the tripartite pact. Remember, France has fallen. Soviet Union is sort of aligned with the Germans. Nobody's standing in there of the German way. The Germans are kicking butt. They take Norway. They kill France. It's They're like, wow, these guys are tough, man. And the Japanese look at this and say, wow, this is a golden opportunity. This only comes once in a thousand years because the Germany is going to take care of all of our problems with the West. That's going to leave us free to do what we want to do in Asia. And indeed, this pact is really aimed against the United States. It's really, that's what the goal here is, to keep the United States busy out of the war in Europe because they're going to be busy with the Japanese. And so we see this as the first real direct linkage of World War II between Asia and the, and the uh, Europeans. And the Chinese... And the Japanese are having this huge fight, too. But this also is an opportunity for another reason. And that reason is, is the United States is beginning to rearm. And we're going to, to build a thing called the Two Ocean Navy. Now, we've already really had a Two Ocean Navy. But this is going to be a real Two Ocean Navy this time. And this is under Carl Vince. And I will talk about this. Uh, when I talk about uh, uh, Midway and uh, and those carrier battles, I'll talk about this more. But just briefly, what's going on here is there's a thing called the Washington Naval Agreement of 1922. There is another naval agreement in London. And what that says is there's going to be a ratio of ships. It's to prevent an arms race post-World War I. The ratio of the British is going to be five. The ratio of the United States is going to be five. And the ratio of the Japanese is going to be three. And the reason that is, is the British have a huge empire, so they need naval forces for that. The United States has to protect the Atlantic and the Pacific. And the Japanese, well, you only have to protect the Pacific. So, don't, you know, this should be fair. And actually, this treaty is actually beneficial to everybody. Because, again, an arm race at that time would have been very difficult. So... But at this particular time, the Japanese, I believe in 36 or 35, pulled out of the, the naval agreements completely. And they've been building their fleet. And they know that by December of 1941, that this is going to be the strongest their fleet will ever be versus the United States fleet. In other words, they will have a 76 percentage number. So they'll still be smaller than us. But that 76% is all in the Pacific. We will not be able to match that because we're worried about the Germans in the Atlantic. So this is another piece of that opportunity for them to go to war. This always is a, is a piece of pressure. You, you really realize how much difference there is in the size of these navies that's going to happen by 1944. They'll be at 30% just by building. That's how much more capacity we have. And that's not counting any losses in a war. That's just the capacity of building. And our economy isn't even at full strength. Theirs is. So 
That's probably an underestimate. Well, the prime minister at this time is an admiral named Yonai. And Yonai says, this is a bad idea, guys. We should not, we should not get involved with the Nazis. Uh, this is not a good plan. And the Japanese army has the capability to bring down a government. I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but the war minister is an essential piece of the government. The war minister is an army general. He is ordered by the army high command to withdraw from the government. As soon as he does that, the government falls. Who comes back? Our old buddy Kanoe. So Kanoe is once again back in power, and he says, yes, I like Hitler. And so they signed the tripartite pact. Well, we quote historian S.C.M. Payne. He says this, the tripartite pact alliance with Germany transformed Japan from a minor irritant into a key player in the worldwide threat to overturn global order. This is the key factor of when this has now become an actual global war because they signed that tripartite pact. And we'll see this as particularly next week, I'll go into more detail. Well, this pact all of a sudden has injected Japan into the thought process of the world as far as strategic thinking. It's like, well, now we gotta worry about Japan and we gotta worry about you know, Russia and we gotta worry about all these other things because they're gonna put pressure on us in, in Asia. And so this has become one of the biggest issues for the Europeans as the axis has really started to grow now into a worldwide problem. What it does, though, is it's going to raise China's role. China now is a very, very important player because they are the opposition to Japan at this point. So now China becomes more of a strategic partner worldwide. And we see this is going to become a key part of U.S. policy. Chang sees this. Remember, he's always looking for support. He's always looking for allies. And he sees how the joining the tripartite pact could be disastrous for Japan. And he says this. He says, Kanoe is Japan's prince of self-destruction. He knows that they put themselves in a lot of jeopardy by what they've just done. Amazingly, we would think today, the Soviets are going to create a pact with the Japanese. They're going to have a Japanese neutrality pact. They're going to sign this on April 13th of 1941. This is approximately two months before the Germans invade Soviet Russia. Operation Barbarossa for those Russian history aficionados. Uh, Japanese goals are to secure the border of Manchukuo. If they can keep the Russians out of Manchukuo and demilitarize it, they have a lot more troops to use to go south and capture that southern resource area. Russian goals are simply to reduce the threat of Japan because they're getting a little concerned that Hitler's getting a little getting a little jiggy over on the on the Western Front there. And maybe we need to make sure there's not a two-front war. Germans have goals. They want the Japanese, and they tell them as much, that they want them to go to war with the United States because the United States is beginning to is supplying Britain with Lend-Lease. There's all sorts of incidents between your German submarines and the United States Navy in the Atlantic, and Hitler is very, very concerned about the U.S. and wants them distracted so he can con control Europe and, and basically beat the Soviet Union. And Article 2 says they're going to support each other in the sense that they're going to maintain complete neutrality, so much so that U.S. Lend-Lease aid, in, uh, starting in October of 41, sails right past Japan all throughout the war. Now, it doesn't con contain weapons after the war starts, but it does contain trucks and locomotives and food. In fact, 50% of Lend-Lease aid to the Soviet Union during World War II sails right past Japan and goes to Vladivostok. They never interdict that. So that's followed. Well, the United States realizes that because of this pact, one of the key factors of this pact, too, is the Soviets will no longer provide any aid whatsoever to the Chinese. The United States says, okay, well, you know what? We're going to kick you a $50 million loan. 
because we need to support China. Well, things are coming to more of a head because once again, we see the Japanese are going to move into this area. This is, they now have this peace with the, with the, well, truce with the Russians in effect. And this is going to free up troops so they can capture French Indochina. They start to negotiate with the French over this peace. And we have a thing called magic. And magic is not reading Japanese military codes. It's reading Japanese diplomatic codes. It's a key function. It's much different than ultra in Europe, where those are military codes primarily. These are diplomatic codes, but you could still learn a heck of a lot of information, <laughs> really critical information, reading diplomatic codes. And we know that this is going to be the Japanese idea. And if you're interested in this topic, I think it's a tremendously interesting one. I don't, I can't recommend a book off the top of my head, but read up on 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 magic. It's an amazingly brilliant effort by the United States to duplicate this uh, Japanese machinery that runs this, much like the Enigma machine in Germany. So what happens then is they think that they're, and Roosevelt knows because of this, that they're going to occupy French Indochina. If they do that, FDR is thinking that what they'll do next is they'll invade Thailand and Burma. Once they take Burma, that's the only access to supply China with military aid. China aid comes in from Rangoon. It goes on a railhead up north and then catches roads, and those roads lead into China. It's the only place left because the Chinese are no longer getting aid from the Soviet Union. So this is critical to the United States. They can't allow this to happen. Well, <laughs> FDR always wants to focus on Germany. And he's trying to get the Japanese to back off from this area. We'll talk a lot about this next week. But he says, look, why don't we do this? We'll just demilitarize Indochina. And when we demilitarize it, you know, you can get tin and rubber and we get tin and rubber. We can all get natural resources. And, and you know what else? You can kind of get yourself away from the Germans. You can kind of decouple yourself from the tripartite pact. And of course, the Japanese say, ah, nah. And they send 140,000 troops into southern Indochina. And they are really in a tough position now because they tell the U.S., which is always amazing to me, they tell the U.S., you know, well, we've done this. We sent 140,000 troops here, but you shouldn't really worry about it. But you know what you could do for us? is you could help negotiate a peace between us and China. Well, of course, that's the last thing that FDR is ever going to do. And talk about this a little bit. And the ambassador to Japan, the U.S. ambassador to Japan, is a man named Gru. Gru has gone to school with FDR. They are close associates. They know each other quite well. And Gru asks... FDR, what he thinks about go, what's going on in, in, in Asia. And FDR says, quote, I believe that the fundamental proposition that we must recognize is the hostilities in Europe, in Africa and Asia are all part of a single world conflict. As early as 1940, he is totally committed that this is World War. Rue, and I'll throw a quick cut out from him. Rue is talking about the German victory, and what that means to the Japanese. And Gru says, the victory by the Germans over France has gone to the Japanese head like strong wine. So indeed, Gru knows pretty much what's going on in Japan, much more so than uh, most of the United States government. Well, what's going to happen next? The U.S. is going to make a response to the incursions into southern Indochina, and that's going to be big. We're going to embargo oil and gasoline. We're going to freeze the Japanese assets. Remember, we are providing 80% of their fuel. The Japanese 
also received that extra 20% from the British and the Dutch. They cut off their fuel. All their fuel is basically cut off. And further, and I find this really amazing, is that on July 23rd of 1941, we begin to offer Lend-Lease aid to China. This is before we send it to the Soviet Union. We don't send Lend-Lease aid to Russia until October of 1941. So before China is now elevated basically to the same level as Great Britain at this time before uh, Pearl Harbor. Well, the U.S. military, particularly uh, Richmond Kelly Turner here, Admiral Richmond Kelly Turner, he says, you know, he's head of naval intelligence, by the way. He says, you know, this is really not probably a very good idea, okay, to embargo their fuel because it's probably going to cause the Japanese to invade Malaysia and Indonesia, and uh, it could bring us into the war. And Turner says directly that trade with Japan not be embargoed at this time. FDR says no. FDR said this is just a prelude to further Japanese aggression. They are going to go into Thailand. They are going to go into Burma. They're going to cut off China. And it's critical that we keep China in the war. Because by keeping China in the war, it neutralizes a two-front war against the Russians, which are critical to us defeating Germany. By keeping China in the war, it prevents them from attacking the British and the Dutch in the Far East. This helps the British and Dutch fight against Germany. Every effort here is really about Germany and the United States. But indeed, that is the main political goal of FDR prior to December 7th, 1941. It's always about keeping China in the war because that will help us defeat Germany. And with that, I want to thank you for all coming today. And we will pick this up again next week when we talk about the last time of Pearl Harbor. And we'll have special operational history of Pearl Harbor as well. So thank you.